I was when I when I explored recycling in the UK and Sweden, um, I noticed that there were quite different moral messages being used to encourage consumers to recycle in those in those um, two countries. And I was interested in you know, why why it was, and if we could relate that back to the system institutional system of provision for recycling. So I've been um, trying to uh, work, work through a particular framework for thinking about moral economies. And today is actually my first attempt to try and apply that framework to fair trade as well. So I'll be interested in, in, in your feedback on that and see how, see how well it works. <laughs> so I was just going to say the projects on which today's um, uh, discussion are going to be based are my, um, my, my PhD research, which looked at fair trade consumption and support, and um, the project that um, uh, Adrian just described, working with Miriam Glucksman on consumption work and societal divisions of labour. So I'll be just there, just acknowledgements there to where this data has come from. Okay. Okay. The ideas that I'm going to be working with today um, take their starting point from sort of sociological conceptions of the economy. So this is authors such as Polanyi, um, Swedberg, Granavetta, Zaliza who in their different ways have explored the relationship between economy and society. And a key feature of their various works is the rejection of the idea that the economy can be in some way separated out from social, cultural and political spheres. The economy is understood as a dynamic and organic feature of society in which processes of production, distribution, exchange and consumption are differentially instituted. Um, a key focus of much of their work under the heading of this um, economic sociology is to seek to understand interactions between various institutions like the state, um, civil society, families, and how these interactions influence and shape um, the constitution of the economy. And it's in this tradition that my exploration of moral economy sits. Okay, so in this paper we're going to be looking at recycling and fair trade, focusing on the way these different uh, moral economies have been constructed to mobilise a whole range of actors um, to operate in different, purportedly fair or just ways. Um, you know, in many ways these two sets of practice are quite different um, from one another. You know, recycling is an industry that relies upon uh, the sustainable management of consumer waste, and I do focus more on household waste than, uh, than industrial waste. Um, it's an activity that con connects consumers with a range of public and private actors who use these materials for different ends, be that to, uh, to, to make some profit from the sale of, of recyclable materials or whether to avoid certain you know, taxes from, from placing waste onto landfill sites, for example. And the journey of recyclable material is something that's often quite opaque for consumers. Um, they're told to contribute without really knowing where that waste actually ends up. Um, on the other hand, uh, fair trade consumption operates on quite a different set of material practices and imaginary cultural resources. Uh, this moral economy relies heavily upon global imaginations that seek to make those relationships between production and consumption very visible to the consumer. Um, consumers are told to choose fair trade products um, over their non-fair trade alternatives in order to ensure that producers can receive a fair deal. And that model um, really relies on this understanding of the market as necessarily exploitative. It's necessarily exploitative, so we need to have this, um, um, actors who join together, either organised um, um, organised groups of consumers or NGOs who need to rebalance those, uh, those inequalities. But despite these um, obvious differences, both practices are widely understood to be conducted in the name of broader moral concerns to help to secure things like environmental and social justice. And they form one part of a growing interest in the, the use of the sphere of consumption to enact um, social and political aims. And they both rely on a complex network of actors and institutions organised within um, a neoliberal economy, where the consumer is understood to uniquely hold the power to regulate the market through conscious and informed choices. Now, comparative work is particularly useful for exploring um, the distinctive context in which economic processes are institutionalised. And whilst my previous work has very much focused upon um, uh, it, uh, these different practices in different countries, today I'm actually just going to be looking at, um, uh, at, at recycling and fair trade in the UK. Um, part of my reason for doing this is in keeping with um, Paladani uh, Simani, I think that's how you say it, um, she's, her notion of consumption norms and how they are con constituted through distinct cosmologies that are framed by access to local cultural resources and political ideas. 
Okay. So moral economy has been defined as the study of the ways in which economic activities in the broad sense are influenced by moral political norms and sentiments and how conversely those norms are comprised by economic factors. Now, although the concept of moral economy has a very long heritage, um, there have actually been very few attempts to formalise its study. And we can identify different strands in the exploration of the moral economy, from how uh, moral principles have been institutionalised in certain economies, to people's everyday evaluations of what is the right course of action in particular contexts. But there have been quite there have been a few attempts to bring these disparate strands together and to, into an analytical frame that can encompass both its institutional formation and its everyday shaping by actors from within. Um, in a recent paper, Bolton and Lazar draw together different strands of the study of the moral economy. Um, and uh, they're, they're, they're informed by the writings of Polanyi, E.P. Thompson and Sayer. And they try and take these different approaches to moral economy into an analytical frame. And it does this by looking at the economy at three levels or scales. Firstly, how morals are embedded within economic processes. So drawing from Polanyi, Polanyi um, challenged the idea of the self-regulating market and instead argued that all economies are underpinned by the social, political and moral values which enable them to function. And Polanyi's argument that the human economy is embedded and enmeshed in institutions, economic and non-economic, led scholars to explore the shifting place of the economy within society and how different economic processes are instituted at different times and places. So at this level, your analytical focus is going to be um, paying attention to the way that the state may intervene into the market and how those different economic processes of production, distribution, exchange and consumption are relationally shaped within particular historical configurations um, to generate particular understandings of fairness and reciprocity. Example. But looking at state and institutional relationships can only take us so far. It um, doesn't explore how communities and collective movements can resist marketisation to, and together oppose unfair or destructive economic practices. E.P. Thompson's um, examination of the food riots or in the 18th century revealed how communities oppose unfair prices of grain in defence of their traditional rights using the principles of an older paternalist model to justify their objections to that encroaching free market economy. So in this conception, people are the bearers of historical customs and moral evaluations of their community. And by paying attention to this, adds a very different layer to thinking about moral economies than just focusing on institutional relationships. So at this layer, we're seeking to... Um, uncover where ideas about different ethical practices might emerge from and the role that the community and interest groups might play in promoting particular ideas about responsible waste management, for example, or fair trade, as well as how communal legitimacy for particular policies is, is, is established because it's, it's, it's an interdependent process. Okay, and then quite the final element of this moral economy framework is, is informed by Sayer's work on laying normativities. So this kind of bridges the gap between institutional and community norms and people's, with people's everyday reflective capacities. So pe people are quite capable of, of, of reflecting on what is of value, how, how we ought to be living, what is worth striving for and what is not. And these sorts of questions take the centre stage, revealing the diversity and complexity of moral life. And by paying attention to people's lay normativities surrounding recycling and fair trade, we can learn how those demands of governments, institutions and communities affect individuals in their daily lives and, and their response to those demands as well. So importantly, all of these three levels interconnect and should be understood to mutually shape one another. So I'm just going to briefly say the, the data from which this is drawn, um, the two projects, and we'll start with recycling because uh, that's where I first applied this moral economy framework. And this was um, field work that was conducted in 2011 and 12, um, and we were looking at um, this idea of consumption work with a key focus on recycling. So what do consumers do in order to, and, and how far they sort their waste, how does that influence the onward chain within a process of recycling? And we, we focused on three local authorities in England, 
Um, we interviewed various waste experts. We went to waste treatment facilities. But, and we also spoke, um, spoke to um, 30 households in the UK talking about how they organise their recycling. And then for my PhD research, um, I focused my research in a fair trade town, the growing, growing movement across the UK and beyond. Um, and uh, it, it's, it's part of the way of institutionalising fair trade purchasing um, and, and bringing together grassroots movements for change. Um, and I interviewed both people within that town who were members of the Fair Trade Town uh, Network, and then those people who lived in the town but perhaps didn't actually have um, an overt commitment to the movement. Okay, so they weren't they weren't recruited on that on that basis. And that was nineteen household interviews and non focus groups. And I later did some research thinking about how we could apply those things in a comparative context. What I'm now going to present is um, the moral economies of recycling first um, and try to talk through how I think they have been constituted at these three different levels. Okay. Okay. So one of the challenges of um, exploring recycling in the UK context is, well, firstly, um, waste is a devolved issue, so actually... Um, we have different practices of recycling in England, Scotland, Wales. Um, so, and, and each local authority has its own unique way of, of handling the waste. So this is one of the biggest challenges when we come to try and explore the moral economy of recycling because the, there's a lot of levels of variation um, uh, and involvement of different public and private actors um, within various local authorities across, across the country. So um, it was, it's quite different from when we were exploring this in Sweden and there's just one system across and it's shared across the whole, the whole country. So it, it was a bit, it's a bit more of a stretch, I suppose, in this particular context because of so much variation that goes on. Um, following the Recycling Act in 2002, it was compulsory for all households to have a curbside collection of waste, but it was completely left up to local authorities to decide how they wanted to put that into practice. Um, so there's much, um, so much of this discussion gives a sense of a kind of a national character of recycling in England, but of course, you know, there's just much less coherence than there was in the Swedish context. Um, so there are different rationales that, that underpin why people, um, why, why, um, why recycling is conducted at the uh, local authority level, different private and public relations that lead to different moral messages about the need to recycle. Recycling has traditionally been promoted as an environmental action to consumers, but often this is, is placed in relation to the alternative mechanism for disposal, which is landfill. Okay, so landfill disposal has been dominant since World War II, being a relatively cheap and safe method of disposal. However, it's a solution that is environmentally damaging and increasingly costly, costly because of EU legislation which led to an escalating landfill tax, £80 a tonne at present, I think. So local authorities that dump their waste onto landfill sites have to pay a lot of money, um, which when coupled with a diminishing number of available and suitable sites, has left many to seek alternative ways of dealing with their waste materials. Um, but of course, this is organised in a context in, of, um, of a system of private sector dominance of waste management services. So like many other public services, waste management was privatised in the 1980s, 1990s, and the private sector provides collection and disposal services. Unlike in Sweden, where the producers were made responsible for any waste that they put onto the market, in England, producers have a very limited responsibility in this system, meaning that once it's collected, recyclable materials can then be sold on, on the market for a profit. Um, and certainly the, the, the sorts of public-private partnerships that are developing between local authorities and big multinationals like Veolia and Cite, you know, allow for some of that sharing of income from the recyclable materials. Because of its kind of private sector shaping, um, you know, this system, you know, recycling is very much often offered as a customer service, a service that needs to be made as easy as possible for consumers to engage with. Um, there's quite a lot of debate about the relative merits of um, a commingled versus a source separated collection, with the former representing the least effort for the consumer, 
Um, but it often pre presupposes a relationship between um, the, a private provider who can then provide um, a material recovery facility for onward sorting of that recyclable material. But doubt, doubts remain about those, the quality and the end and destination for, for that material. <coughs> Now, providing a backdrop to these varying systems of collection and processing is a, is a national government that has not been especially proactive on environmental issues and has left it very much to the private sector um, to ensure that the materials are handled sustainably. So they haven't, as I said, they haven't institutionalised kind of compulsory producer responsibility, but more voluntary um, engagement with um, reducing sort of packaging. And they only did this, really, after pressure from Friends of the Earth principally, and from EU legislation, which has made that landfilling of waste that much more problematic and costly for them. And what we find is that, in, in certainly in recent years, this, this message of austerity, because it's being organised by the local authorities, this message of, message of austerity is, is infiltrating the ways in which consumers are being encouraged to recycle their waste. Um, it's, an, it's being framed as an action that saves money. Um, and this is entirely plausible, given that political economy of waste management in England, because by not putting your waste into landfill, and generate, you are actually generating some returns of, for, the, for your local authority of that recyclable material. And that might not be in terms of actually um, physical return in terms of um, selling the materials. It might just be that you're avoiding the landfill tax that's so expensive. So if you're sending it somewhere else, you don't have to pay the £80 a tonne to, to put it into, um, into, into landfill. So this is, this is quite a different moral message that is surrounding the recycling of, of, of waste than you might hear in other contexts, which is very much focused on recycling for the environment. Let's just give you an example of that. So in Islington in 2011, let's just take this from their website, so it says, um, Islington is a home to a lot of people on low incomes, and is the London borough hardest hit by cuts from central government. To protect your services, we need to save money wherever we can. One way of doing this is by recycling. It costs £80 for every tonne of rubbish you throw out, but just £15 for every tonne of recycling. The cost of throwing rubbish away is also going to increase far more steeply in the future than the cost of recycling, and this is your money. So recycling more means that money can be saved, and more important, Islington services, rather than throwing it into the rubbish. So encouraging consumers to participate in this very different articulation of the moral economy of recycling appeals to the collectivism inspired by the uh, welfare state, but, can, but it can only really be understood in the context of institutional system of provision for waste management. Because, variation, because of those variations within, um, across England, not all local authorities are communicating this message, um, but it, and, and environmental messages do, con do continue to be prevalent, but I think this emerging moral message looks set to continue to continue because of the way that recycling is promoted by the third sector and how recycling is actually understood by consumers themselves. Let's move to that. So how is the public then persuaded to participate in this moral economy, whether environmental or otherwise? So we need to turn to those collective customs and legitimacy. So there are a number of pressure groups um, that generate a lot of public debate about and push their positions onto the policy making processes, highlighting the interactions between systems of recycling provision and actions of civil society. So organisations like Friends of the Earth or the campaign to stop um, incineration in, in, in the local community, they sort of help to both legitimise and challenge institutional systems of provision. Um, so local activists challenging the building of incineration plants, for example, which in, Com in Thompson's scheme might reflect that defence of the community rights to a clean environment, or in fact they might be challenging the marketisation of waste by private companies. If you look on Foe's website, you'll find that they do have a strong platform on this, and suggesting that more needs to be done on, on, on a public basis. In fact, we probably wouldn't have had a, a curbside recycling system if it was not for Friends of the Earth, because they lobbied the government to make sure that that was put into place. And they very much highlighted how important it was for, to, for it to be easy for the consumer to, to engage with this. And this is again reflected in the, uh, in the approach of the state, who, um, drawing on science of behavioural change, um, seek to make recycling the default option by changes to those choice architectures, so, such as you know, fortnightly rubbish collections and the co-mingled recyclable collection. 
and use these alongside some of the more um, uh, conventional understanding of like fines and incentives of behavioural change. But public debates around the weekly collection, for example, um, generated a lot of public debate um, as recycling was both challenged and defended according to the language of consumer and citizen rights and responsibilities. You may remember that Eric Pickles said it's the basic right for every English man and woman to be able to put the remnants of their chicken tikka masala in their bin without having to wait a fortnight for it to be collected. But then, of course, this was countered by, uh, by Waste Watch, who said, you know, would everyone really put a weekly collection of waste above ensuring our fellow neighbours receive the care they need if they suffer from a disability, or that the elderly receive support to heat their home in the winter? So both Waste, Waste Watch and uh, the very Friends of the Earth were defending that moral economy of recycling by drawing on the economic value of recycling for the taxpayer for it, rather than its environmental benefits. So then we can see how that political economy um, of waste in the context of austerity was articulated to um, legitimise changes to the collection infrastructure and challenge those who proclaimed they had a right to throw. However, the success of those policies and appeals to citizens and consumers to handle their waste more responsibly rely on the lay activities of those people who are actually participating in this system. So when we spoke to consumers and we spoke to them about why they recycled, quite a lot of them would say that they felt that they recycled because they had to, and they feared to be fined if, 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 they, if they did not. Um, so Gemma says, you know, we generally do it because we're told to do it. If there was never any laws and we wasn't told any of this, everything would probably just go in one bin. However, the feeling of compulsion was often tempered by a belief that their actions were also benefiting the environment in some way. In particular, most consumers imagined kind of a landfill site um, as the final destination for their rubbish and recycling. And recycling was one way in which they could prevent that. In many ways, not allowing um, resources to waste away on a landfill site was the key message, rather than consumers identifying with the spirit of environmental morality. So Claire says, I feel like it's because I've got this moral obligation to recycle. Don't feel like it's because I've got a moral obligation. It's a service, it's logical, why wouldn't you? I'm not a green crusader, and our prize cars kind of prove that, but it's a logical thing to do. If you don't have to waste resources and you can um, do it, then why not? So, wasting resources um, and values of thrift are brought to, brought to the, brought to the fore. Um, whilst hardly any were aware of that saving um, public money message, you can see that these moralities kind of resonate with a broader institutional moral economy of waste management in, in the UK. Um, but whilst it might be quite successful encouraging people to recycle more, um, it only will be successful if the citizens you know, trust the state to spend the money more wisely. So Tim said, I, yeah, I don't believe in saving public money, I think they should spend more money. Um, so, you know, so mis mistrust between the state and the citizens. <laughs> So you see, see this, this trust between the state and its citizens can undermine the moral economy, particularly at a time when cuts to public services are damaging those existing trust relationships. Um, infrastructural changes um, were generally uh, um, received quite positively, but when they violate ex established norms of cleanliness and care, they, uh, then, then they, they, they can run into difficulties, or if they're experienced as unfair. So um, Ian and, Ivy and Brian were an unemployed couple uh, with three children under four. So her bin was completely full of nappies and they had fortnightly collections. And then her local council removed the cardboard collection and said that the cardboard also had to go into the bin as well. And so when she called them saying, you know, what am I supposed to do with all of this waste? They said, oh, you know, you, you need to get on a bus so you can go and recycle the waste. Mm -hmm. So it didn't, didn't do anything to, to convince her of the value of recycling and sort of, again, sort of damage those relations of trust between the state and her, her local authority. Okay, so we can, from looking at the recycling example, we can see how um, ideas about saving resources and saving money are constituted at all three levels of that moral economy framework. But also how those ideas are subject to debate, resistance and appropriation by different institutions and individuals, who together generate particular moral sentiments around the practice of recycling. So we'll move to fair trade now. It's really hot in here, isn't it? It is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, proper open. Okay. Mm -hmm. As soon as we clean the room, they just 
been a few days. Yeah, the last few days have been boring. Yeah. Okay, so um, fair trade goods have become a stable feature of our everyday lives in the UK. They're widely available through supermarkets, public buildings and catering establishments. But it hasn't always been that way. If we look at the historical trajectory of fair trade provisioning in the UK, we can tell quite a different story uh, of alternative trading companies who in the 1960s and 70s developed alternative routes for a range of products. Um, these were primarily sort of coffee and handicrafts were some of the most important of those. And they were sold often via um, you know, specialist catalogues or, or church stores, their trade craft being quite an important um, uh, player in this whole history of fair trade in, in the UK. Um, it's a Christian alternative trading organisation and uh, volunteers used to, to run fair trade stalls at the back of the churches and still do, I think. Um, but by the 1990s, um, a number of global factors, principally the dismantling of the International Coffee Agreement and the critically low prices that farmers were receiving for their crops, led to movements in Holland and later in the UK to develop the Fair Trade Certification System. So in 1992, a collective um, comprised of Tradecraft, the World Development Movement, Women's Institute and Cathod together formed the Fair Trade Foundation. And we saw that brands like Café Direct, Green and Black, Snare Gold Chocolate were hitting the supermarket shelves in 1994. <coughs> Taking their lead from their Dutch counterparts, the, uh, this organisation manages the production, distribution, exchange and consumption of fair trade goods in the UK. So they help to set those, those standards for fair trade relations. In terms of trade, they decide who can sell fair trade products in the UK and where they can sell them. But... Despite the fact that, that they were initiated in 1992, the, uh, the mainstreaming of fair trade did not really happen or really take off until um, 2000 when Co-op Supermarket um, launched their own brand of fair trade chocolates in 2000. And this was soon followed by other supermarkets who started to offer their own brand version of fair trade coffee, tea, and in the case of Sainsbury's, all, all bananas became fair trade bananas. Mm. So what we see is, is, is the 100% uh, is the, is the switch. Okay, so this is where um, businesses um, take the decision to remove the choice of non-fair trade options and, and, and place only fair trade options onto the shelves. And, and in addition to that, to supermarkets, um, we've seen you know, companies like Nestle and um, uh, Cadbury's also switching to offer only fair trade options and it's, and it's changes like that that I say have led to the growth of this accidental fair trade consumer. Um, alongside the changing landscape of fair trade provisioning we find, um, <coughs> we find the national government is, uh, is, is supportive of fair trade um, but it's very much um, framed as a voluntary initiative between citizens and the market. It's not saying that they overtly endorse, because of course there are many other labels on the market, so they can't necessarily be seen to support one particular brand over another. This is a private sector label that offers some benefits to producers in the developing world, but of course it is one of many. But having said that, DFID has provided quite substantial um, grants to the Fair Trade Foundation to, um, to support that, that initiative. Um, Um, also, what the uh, national government done has have they um, released some guidance on how to manage the procurement of fair trade within local authorities, for example. So, um, in order to be in keeping with EU commissioning laws, so that they don't actually say, you know, they can't stipulate fair trade, but there are ways to sort of word the provisioning policies in which um, we can try to demand more fair trade through that. Um, and at the local authority level, I think the, fair, the support for fair trade very much tends to be secured through the fair trade town networks, which I'll come to on the next slide. But in general, I think we characterise the government 
um, support for fair trade in a similar vein to the way that they support another, a, a whole range of other food-related issues, things like you know, the public health responsibility deal. So they're, they're keen to partner with industries in the private sector and encouraging them to voluntarily address sustainability goals in their practices. And probably the most recent example of that is the Food Retail Industry Challenge Fund, which are grants that are being given to um, link African farmers um, with businesses in, in the UK. And many of them were fair trade businesses as well, or fair, were, were adhering to fair trade practices. practices. So therefore, it's consumers who are supported by responsible businesses who then become the key sites of, of, of social change. Okay, so then if we move to this level of collective customs, where attention shifts to the growing number of citizens and organisations that debate and discuss the need for fairer access to trade routes for poorer farmers <laughs> in the developing world. And we kind of start the story back again with the, the trade club, their traders at the back of the church hall. Because I think it's really important to say that um, the, 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 the provisioning of fair trade in the UK is in no small part down to the massive grassroots support who have been very active in demanding that fair trade is taken seriously and enters that mainstream market. Um, so trade craft fair traders are you know, an army of, of, of fair traders, I think they were called, were, you know, were already in place uh, across, across the country. Um, when the fair trade town movement was established in 2000, um, they sort of became appropriated into, into that movement. So fair trade towns um, began when this guy um, called Bruce Crowther, it's not there, it's a vet from Garstang, um, he declared that his town was the first fair trade town. And being a fair trade town means securing support from your local council to um, procure fair trade goods so that at meetings, etc., there is only a fair trade option available and actively seeking support from local businesses and community groups of so churches and schools um, and getting them to um, support fair trade um, too. So key actions of fair trade supporters are organising events around fair trade, perhaps arranging visitors, visits from um, producers um, and generally trying to raise awareness and visibility to show the demand for fair trade in their town, um, often organised over the two-week period of fair trade fortnight. And this grassroots action is fueled by a very specific articulation of the fair trade producer and consumer. So cultural intermediaries and advertising plays a very vital role in communicating that fair trade is a worthy action for consumers to be participating within, that it makes a difference. It serves to connect a network of consumers to a network of needy producers through that act of purchasing but also you know, through visual displays in supermarkets. So you see there's interconnections between business and um, at different levels of that moral economy. Visits to fair trade town networks to provide that first-hand account of a positive transformation, so influencing how, uh, how fair trade towns go ahead and, uh, and support fair trade further. And of course, these, uh, these images of smiling producers and narratives of change have been widely critiqued, um, but they do provide vital cultural resources from which that moral economy is constituted. Fair trade is also endorsed by various celebrity figures, so Harry Hill and Chris Martin there, pictured, um, which uh, kind of serves to show that these fair trade products are, 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 are distinctive. You know, they're, they're not products that are purely consumed for, for the moral reasons, but also because our role models are, are supporting them as well and perhaps because of their superior quality. Okay, taken together, these different elements um, work to construct a very particular image of the fair trade citizen consumer. The fair trade supporter is someone with an active interest in fair trade, who wants to challenge injustice, who is so committed that they spend their free time encouraging their friends and local residents to buy more fair trade. It is this grassroots support that provides the legitimacy <laughs> for those changes to systems of collective provision. Without this kind of level of support, we would not have seen the 100% switch, I don't think. Um, so the, uh, the, they, they, they sort of cement this idea that the public is very eager for fair trade. Um, and of course, you know, again, we do see some, um, some challenging critique of that. For example, the Adam Smith Institute um, critiqued this idea of choice editing and, 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 uh, and using fair trade in the name of um, of, uh, of fair practices and for defending their own image of the consumer acting within a free market economy. As well as we see various other debates at this level, for example, um, journalistic reports and academic articles that um, 
that sort of challenge the idea of fair trade as necessarily, you know, a, a good thing for producers. So there's, I mean, there is a lot of debate at this level. <coughs> but those who actively support fair trade and make up those those uh, those purchases, you know, um, are probably so. So that um, those who actively support fair trade probably only make up a small minority of all the purchases that that, that take place because of you know the, it becomes it becomes a policy of organisations to offer fair trade. Um, and when we talk to people about what they understand about fair trade and why they do or do not support it, we find some important challenges about what matters in the context of fair trade morality. And it's clear that consumption is already a terrain that is ordinarily ethical. You know, as, uh, as Lisa says, she says, you know, when I buy for my baby, I buy organic. Fair trade does not help my baby and her digestive system, so I'm sorry. No. <laughs> so consumption is already a site of care and concern. So we have to be careful about supplanting new ethical concerns onto, eth onto established norms and practices. Indeed, um, even the very committed fair trade supporters who I spoke with, you know, they were quite, they were quite um, clear that in some circumstances they didn't always buy fair trade because maybe their, their granddaughter didn't like it, didn't like that particular version. So, you know, they, it, it's quite difficult to, uh, to find people who act um, in, in a consistent way. But um, those who do buy fair trade draw on this idea of an imagined community of like-minded supporters who together are making a difference to trade into people's lives. So Leon, he says, if it was just me doing it, then it wouldn't be effective. Um, it just make me feel better. I think that me, lots of, plus lots of other me's are doing it and it's making a difference. So we can see that the understanding of what matters and what to value about fair trade consumption relies upon those understandings that are constituted at that collective level, the level of the fair trade town groups. Who are, who are promoting this idea of fair trade consumers. Okay. Um, but this raises then issues for those people who are not predisposed to support fair trade, or, and some people will actually outright reject the idea that consumers ought to be held responsible for issues of trade injustice, and question the role that governments then ought to play in assuring fairer trading relations um, for trading partners. So, Stephen here, he says, if a government can't make a difference, then what difference can we make? That's the way you see it. So he kind of outright rejects that idea of citizen consumership, which is so embraced by the fair trade supporters. And the perception that fair trade goods are exclusive and the greater price tag that might be associated with them ties morality to the ability to pay. So despite the mainstream provisioning of fair trade goods and the growth of this accidental consumer, the fact that many of us are buying fair trade without even knowing about it, the association of that brand with a distinctive location and distinctive subcultures creates a range of symbolic boundaries between the fair trade consumer and the non-fair trade consumer. And I won't read this because I'm running close to time, but if um, in this exchange we see a real sense of inequality where these two men kind of challenge the idea that ability to pay um, equates to, to, to better morality. So, you know, they, they, they contextualise the fair trade consumer as someone who drives 4 by 4s or Jaguars, they're going on aeroplanes, but they're, they're, they've done their bit by buying a packet of coffee, which is fair trade. They're appearing to the world as morally superior, but they've got all this other stuff going on. Um, so I think it's a real heart, a sense of inequality at the heart of that. So in this paper, I think I've argued that um, different, uh, different systems of provision interact with moral principles to, to form distinct moral economies of recycling and fair trade. And rather than morals and markets being separate, the moral sphere is shaped by and influences the different markets for recyclable and fair trade goods. Um, I hope that I've shown the, the value of looking at the moral economy through a different analytical framework that can encompass all three of those elements, the markets and morals. Um, are co-constituted between or within those levels. So thinking through some of, I was just thinking about how I could pull these together within this shared UK context. And there are so many differences between fair trade and recycling. Um, principally, um, the organisation of recycling by the local authority is a form of, a, um, uh, because they, they need to provide the recycling services as opposed to <laughs> in, uh, the, the fair trade support of local authorities, which is a much more kind of, supporting it through procurement. So there's an, there's an element of differences there. But I think what we do see is that there's a, 
Well, in both, both cases, there's limited intervention of the state with a delegation of responsibility to the private sector and labels. And this then puts the consumer very much at the site of social change um, and, and their voluntary choices. But of course, there is also this liberal paternalism that's implicit in the development of infrastructures or choice editing, which um, suggests specific relations between the state and its citizens, say so the provision of um, recycling systems and, 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 uh, and limiting the, the, the service um, for collection. <coughs> and then you've also got on the other side, you know, editing the choices that are available. So there is still, the state, the state still does play a, 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 an important role and, and various other actors within that. And perhaps unsurprisingly, we've also seen that there's a diversity of ethical practices and difficulties that emerge when these perhaps existing cosmologies are incompatible with new practices. And how ideas about morality, of course, reflect broader social inequalities and localised cultural resources about what is worth valuing.